What you are seeing in front of you is the SBGZ005. It is a $103,000 Grand Seiko made of platinum, gold indices. It is to celebrate Kintaro Hattori's 160th, technically, birthday. It's a limited edition watch. Fantastic. We can take this watch, these same design elements, and push that price all the way down to $4,300 and stay on brand. Grand Seiko's so cool. Yeah. Grand Seiko's designs from this $103,000, you know, platinum masterpiece all the way down to $4,300 um, are, are all in the same language, right? Because Grand Seiko is communicating the same message. Their brand identity is so tight. Right. It is so different than so many other watch manufacturers, right? It is, it is really unique. The differences in these watches are just... How crazy do you want to get really in like the super nuanced finishing of movements, right? Like It's like how close do you want this to be to have one artist behind it? Right. And how how expert does that artist have to be? Exactly. Right. But the offering even below five grand is brilliant, right? Yeah. And that makes it a really, really special brand. Um, but that doesn't mean they don't have a lot to work on. Right. So today's conversation is going to be a good one um, yeah. all about Grand Seiko, uh, particularly in their elegance collection. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what is up, watch friend? I am Chris the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. My name is Michael, and I'm not the curator of the Theo and Harris Watch Shop. All right, you set up this whole episode, my man. Thank you very much. Let's get into it. Grand Seiko never ceases to amaze me with the level of dedication they have to their ethos, even though their ethos is really not the most viable, like, you know, mass market kind of, <laughs> you know, they are so specific and and, yeah. and and they are so good. Like, you guys know that I love Grand Seiko. I've said before, we've said before, Many no times. one works harder for your money than Grand Seiko. I love Grand Seiko, but it's amazing how like they choose every day to die on the sill. Yeah. Oh every yeah. Day. Every single day. So what we're going to do is... <laughs> You're going to die on that hill? Yes, I am. Yep. Why hey, do you ask? Grand Seiko, it's Christian Michael. Just wanted to see if... Are you going to die on this hill? Yes, we are. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Got to go now. Got to go, go die. Yeah. So we're going to really... We're going to go from super expensive Grand Seiko down to the most affordable Grand Seiko, which it, it, to me is just honestly gorgeous. I wish I could get this $103,000 one. But we're then going to discuss that model of dying on a hill when you could move some things around yes. to change how things are made. Because right. you'll, you'll start to see what happens as we go down in price. It's interesting. You're left with a fantastic watch. Yes. But there's some other things that we want to touch on as well. Yes. So we are all familiar with the SBG Z005. That's the one I just went over. There's some watches in between. I didn't, I kind of hit on only ones that fit this category. Mm -hmm. So we have the SBGY026. This is, we both have the Omi Watari, which is not $27,500. But this is something special. This yeah. is an incredibly gorgeous watch. This is one of the most beautiful cases, case designs I've truly ever seen. I, yes. I, I really think this is Grand Seiko's best case design. Um, I love. I would my, agree. I love my Omi Watari. You love yours. Yep. Um, th this is a different dial, and it's obviously the case is 18 karat rose gold. Uh, the dial is cherry blossoms. Grand Seiko takes basically all of their inspiration from nature, which I think is beautiful and poetic, and, and they do it so, so well. This is a beautiful watch. Beautiful yes. watch, and it carries that same... Not design language, maybe design language, but really it carries the same just logic, right? Right. Through. Yes. You know, it's it's elegant, it's understated, it's finely detailed, it's precious metal, right? Like yep. and it's on a leather strap. It's very, very Grand Seiko. And you're starting to see the latter immediately because we have the Omi Watari, mm -hmm. eighty three hundred dollar watch. Yep. This is a twenty eight hundred dollar watch. Yep. There's also a more expensive one, and then they start to hand engrave it and then it goes up and up and up. Yep. So you can see that accessibility of I wanna start here. And I love my watch. This case especially is inspired by wind on a sail, mm -hmm. which I think is gorgeous. But you could see that ladder happen. And again, I'm not going on the ladder of each specific model, but that is one that I did want to note. Yep. And all of these, you know, crazy Grand Seiko's, you know, hundred thousand dollars. You know, those yep. watches are already spoken for. You know, those oh, watches yeah. will really never really hit the market. You know, yep. and if they were to hit the market, as they rarely have, it's been an auction where they they do demand some serious numbers. Yeah, there's right? a lot of demand behind them. And obviously, they've done pretty well um, because they are so rare and because they're so specific. Right. You know, yep. um, and obviously, you know, they're it's prohibitive, right? To even get into that market. 
right? Which kind of reminds us of our friends over at Masterworks. Yes, right? it does. Masterworks understands that most of us are not right eligible to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars on our watches. So Banksy, Monet, exactly. But you can still benefit from the rising market in in the art world. Not watches, but the two are so similar, yeah. right? Through fractional ownership, right? Yeah. Masterworks uses their expertise and understanding of the art you know, industry, right, to acquire rare pieces of crazy art, right, yeah. on behalf of their thousands of investors, and then all these people own different, you know... You don't have this, you have this. It, but that's so interesting. It is interesting because art obviously has historically returned a lot for investors, and Masterworks has 13 exits now with every single one of them returning a profit to their investors. That's unbelievable. It is, but it's also not because it's been happening for hundreds of years. It has. The, the art auction market is so much older than the watch market, right? The watch market is a bit of a young kid, wild west cowboy. You know, it's it's, it's yeah. kind of a mess in many ways, right? We just discussed it lately. Yeah. Um, but the art uh, industry is so much, uh, there's so much more precedent there. Masterworks isn't new to the game, right? They've been around for a couple of years now and they've got over 700,000 people on the platform. Yes. Um, but they seem to have come in at really just this phenomenal time in technology and in the art world, right? Yeah. More and more people are getting into art as, a, as an asset class and the prices really are just going up and up and up. Truly. And speaking of 700, Masterworks has over $700 million worth of blue chip art. And their last three exits netted 10, 13, and 35% net returns to their investors, which is unbelievable. I mean, yep, yeah, that's truly unbelievable, especially now with all of their exits returning profits to investors. Yep. It's phenomenal. I highly suggest you check it out. And while there is a line to join Masterworks, you can skip that line by using our link. Down in the description. So thank you so much, Masterworks, for uh, working with us. This is where it gets very interesting. This is the SBG W260. There's actually three watches here, so some of them are more expensive than what I just mentioned, but one of them is not. This is interesting because to me, and we'll tie this point up at the end, this would be Grand Seiko's bread and butter. Mm. At these, and this style, white dial and stuff like that, we'll go on their cheaper version in a second. But this is what I'm seeing all across Instagram. This is what I'm seeing whenever someone posts it in a forum or on Reddit or something like that. Everybody says like, okay, you know, I'm usually on the fence with Grand Seiko, but these watches are unbelievable. Mm -hmm. This is their 140th anniversary, not from when this watch was made. This was made in the 1960s, but since Seiko was Seiko. This is, it comes in platinum for 38,000. It comes in rose gold for 30,000, yellow gold for 26,000. Mm -hmm. Obviously, listen, they're very expensive watches, but, but you know, this whole, the category is defined by the Calatrava. Right? Patek Philippe's Calatrava is really the, the, the watch that defines this dress watch category. Um, and this watch uh, is, what is it? It's, this is a pure 60s watch. Yeah, so you, you, this watch, this watch is, is simpler, mm -hmm. right? But it's it's subtler. I, 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 this watch does speak to me, right? And, and yeah. frankly, a lot of the time the Calatrava doesn't. But this is yes. beautiful. This is an incredible watch. This is I, you've seen this watch if you've looked at watches mm -hmm. from the '60s. But this is now Grand Seiko reintroducing it. We'll talk about price on these models in a second because, mm -hmm. like I said, I think these would destroy. Mm -hmm. And there's proof of that. Then they have the budget SBGW two five nine. Same watch, same case and everything. Steel, dark blue dial. Right. That goes for eighty three hundred dollars. Beautiful. So, same price. same design language. Really elegant. Uh, yeah, it's, it's this is a great watch. When you go down this ladder, all of a sudden you can't get that perfectly crisp white dial. You go blue dial, and obviously the case material, which is expected, is steel now, not platinum, white gold, something yep. like that. Then we go down to SBGW two eight three forty eight hundred dollars. This is that level of Grand Seiko where you're like, ooh, that is a fantastic deal. That is one of the coolest watches on the market at its price point. Manually wound, thin watch, amazing dial, mm -hmm. and a great size, 37.3 millimeters, Amazing dress watch size. Like, uh, people are, uh, dress watches are more popular than they have been in the last, you know, 10 years, right? Sure. Um, but naturally, if it's not your favorite category, you don't want to allocate a ton of your budget to them. And this is a this is a collection. These Grand Seiko, under $5,000, um, this co whole collection, be, be it in light blue or be it in, you know, uh, cream or whatever. Yep, yep. We'll these watches next. are so great. Uh, they're, they're finished incredibly well. All the markers, all the hands, the dial patterns, everything about them. And their, their hand-wound movement is a simple movement, but it's a very nice movement. That's also this is the cherry on top. For one me. of my favorite uh, dress watches. Yeah. Then, lastly, if forty-eight hundred dollars is too much, 
We can go to $4,300. I did constrain this to mechanical mm -hmm. or automatic watches, mm -hmm. so I'm not including quartz, but you could go lower technically. But we have the SBGW231, which for me, it's between the 283 and the 231. Yep. I think that watch for $4,300 new yep. is an insane deal. It's an insane deal. It is an insane deal. This is essentially everything you could want from a dress watch. But now we get into the interesting conversation of if we're kind of trying to stay in this line, you could go up the line a little bit, but there's always concessions to be made. Like if you want to go a little higher than $4,300, you're not getting that white dial until you go to the 20s mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So I feel like Grand Seiko has a definitely buy it. I don't have to be a fan of the brand or I don't have to be in love with the brand to enter into the Grand Seiko world. And then immediately it jumps into, I do have to be at least somewhat of a fan in the $8,300 range. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is kind of wiped and I have to be obsessed with this brand. Yes. I have to love that brand. But it is a brand that people are obsessed with. It's a relatively speaking small number of people when you know, compared to Patek or sure, compared to Rolex, course. obviously, God knows. Yeah. Um, but people are obsessed with Grand Seiko because their story, when properly told, really is inspiring and it's serene and it's beautiful and it's something that's kind of in a holistic sense, very aspirational, yeah. it's very artistic. It's it's true watchmaking. So people do, you know, end up spending real big money on Grand Seiko and something like when they're manufacturing this stuff over a hundred thousand um, dollars. That's not watch isn't gettable. Like you can't buy yeah, that right. watch. Right. Those, those watches are spoken for because there are that many people already that say, yeah, this is this is a dream. This watch is perfect. Yeah, you know, which is amazing. Yeah. But what you're saying, the most interesting part, and we'll get into the, the actual mechanics and numbers in a second, is Grand Seiko has done or focuses on nature, of course, but they also focus on, and this sounds like it's an ad, it's not an ad, but they also focus on simplifying time to its simplest level for you to enjoy everything else. Mm -hmm. That was the whole ethos behind the Credor, Credor? Mm -hmm. And that, I was not convinced on the Crador, which is a hand-painted enamel watch. I was yeah. like, it's beautiful, it's kind of big, but like, it's a lot of money for, there's no complications, there's nothing, it's just so simple. And then reading about how, yes, it is simple, but it's the most precise, handmade, everything that we could make. Right. The Grand Seiko Micro Artist Studio has a picture of Philippe Dufour wow. in the studio because That's he cool. taught them how to polish the back of a case, wow. how to polish a movement right. with... I forget what plant, but there wasn't a high availability of those plants in Japan. So the Micro Artist Studio now has some collaboration with, I think, a medical studio that gets plants for a specific reason, and they use that to polish the back of the watch. Wow. So, no, it doesn't have a lot of complications and stuff, the Crador, but it is not meant for that. And if you buy into that and you have the money for that... That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Because you're like, no, I'm in a field with my perfect watch. They're doing something that no one is, dares to do, really. I right. mean, they are that connected to their, again, their their brand language, right? What they stand for, yeah. be it at forty three hundred bucks or be it at a hundred thousand dollars. It's you know, they are they are they are taking a simplistic approach on its surface, of course, to watchmaking and and executing that simplistic approach with progressively more insane levels of detail. Right. It's wild, you know, it's, 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 it's wild. Yeah, so then we run into the interesting thing, which is, like I said, this SBGW 260, this is the rose gold one, is stunning, mm -hmm. absolutely stunning. And this is where I see, like, if we're picturing the Grand Seiko ladder, it almost seems like, if you look at Grand Seiko right away, especially on their site, they show the master collection right away, which is 50,000 and up watches, mm -hmm. for reference. It almost seems like they're building a ladder down and not a ladder up. Mm -hmm. As in, most people, when they first enter the Grand Seiko world, are like, oh, I, I can't get up there. It's a $38,000 watch. Like, I saw that on Instagram. The first watch that I saw, I can't afford. I'm out of the brand because everything right. costs that much. Right. So what is, what is the move there? My idea would really be the SBGW259 is great, but it's a little too expensive for grabbing people, and you lose the most iconic part of that watch, which is that flat white dial or that slightly cream dial. Right. Uh, it's a good question. I mean, I, I, I think that the... <laughs> I would need to know more about Grand Seiko's, you know, model when it comes to these, sure. you know, these watches, right? Like, you know, do they do they feel that if they introduced it in a more, you know, 
kind of mass market color, uh, a more approachable color? Do they feel that it would cannibalize their precious metal business? Mm. That's possible. That's what um, I thought with the steel. It's possible, um, but but the solution I, I think would be do something even extra with these precious metal models yeah. that that you know that makes it even you know more a little bit more different and special so that the people that are into the precious metal level of Grand Seiko mm -hmm. are getting a little bit more than just the metal right right and 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 if they get a little bit more than just the metal uh, I think that they will they will not get cannibalized. Like those people will not go down market and buy the steel watch. Right, right. right. Um, definitely. Uh, look, I mean, you know, uh, I, th I think it's great that a watch manufacturer at this level even manufactures, I mean, their, their business is in steel, right? But yeah. I think they even manufacture watches in steel is funny, right? Like w watch brands that achieve this level of watchmaking really don't make watches in steel, right? Like, like Paddock doesn't make watches in steel. I mean, a couple, you have the, you have the, what, the weekly calendar was in steel. I mean, obviously you've got the Nautilus and the Aquanaut, but, but, but those are sports models, those are right? Those decidedly like, steel, you know, of course. Paddock doesn't make fine watches in steel. They never have, right? right. I mean, you know, oh, every yeah. once in a yeah, while. Yeah, yeah, you could production. say, well, there's one that's sold. Yeah, really, right, yeah, course, not in production, yeah. you know? So so the fact that Grand Seiko even does is interesting, right? They're they're trying to deliver high-end watchmaking to the mass, right, to the people. Yeah. Um, I just think they need to do it in a way that, you know, is just a little bit... Like they they are going out of their way to do it. Of course, they could just go a little obvious. bit further and 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 make it even more not just accessible because you can't get more accessible, but right. make it a little bit wider appeal. Yes, and that's that's kind of what I'm what I'm really getting at is like when we look at that watch and then we look at the two five nine. Ideally, there is something in the middle, and there is there's this watch, but something that still has the main focus of the watch, the right. white dial. Whether you're a Submariner guy or a 50 Fathoms guy or a Day Date guy or, or an FP Journe guy, you've gotta just take a step back and appreciate this history here. This isn't stuff you're gonna find in a, you know, in a showcase. This is not mass produced stuff, which is beautiful in its own right. I mean, this is treasure hunting. I've told you, we've talked about this plenty of times before, but I make jackets that come from Japan and talk to a lot of people in Japan, and they say a very cultural thing is extreme limited editions. There's an extreme limited edition soda that you love it, or you get like a snack, you yeah. love it, you're obsessed with it, and then it, it's gone and it never comes back. Yeah. That's the, that's the cycling of things in Japan, so that's a very right. cultural thing. What are your thoughts on extreme limited editions at this price point? Because Hublot does it, but it gets to the point where you look at their site and it is a ton of limited editions. Yeah, I mean, I think it is, this is just my opinion. And, and, of course, and, these are all know, opinions. Just, course, just yeah. my opinion. When, when you're an international brand, yes. right, uh, it is important to communicate your message and not compromise your message, um, but to translate that message to the culture that you are aiming Mm. at mm -hmm. right yes. uh, so I do think Grand Seiko should alter their model a little bit step a little bit further away from limited editions in markets like the American market uh, who definitely reward limited editions to a degree but too many and it feels uh, indecisive too many and it feels people get you know bored right i mean yeah. people just get like okay another one from you okay come on cut it out mm -hmm. right if it's you, when uh, you go to an event and everybody's showing you their limited edition grand seiko and you're like right. i don't get it but that looks like the only watari right you're like it's not though yeah see that that eventually i think that that, that gets old for american buyers mm -hmm. and i think that that's one of the that's one of the hurdles that grand seiko does face uh, i don't think that their american you know, corporate structure has any say in that matter. I don't think that they have a, I don't know how much of a say they have mm -hmm. uh, in telling Japan, hey guys, let's do this the slightly more American way, right? We're still making these true Japanese artisanal watches and, and our messaging is your messaging, but 
Let's just refine our our schedule a little bit. Let's just make this a little bit more, you know, conducive to American buyers. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's what I think. Because frankly, the truth is, even though I love Grand Seiko, I love Grand Seiko. Again, really, no one works harder for your money than Grand Seiko. True. Those um, forty three hundred, forty eight hundred dollar level of watches, you, it's unbelievable value. Even at eight thousand, the only Atari is insane. Oh yeah, value. yeah, yeah. I just mean even lower. It's like, yeah. are you kidding? It's insane. That's an insane watch. It's insane. Yeah. So so it's incredible, but. People definitely like. I'm, I have years, right? Like I know that people say, ah, it's just fucking confusing to me. Yeah, that's right. what people say. Like I don't know, I don't know. I don't know. There's, there's a lot. There's eighty watches SBGY, on SBGK, SBGK, Too many. Yeah, well, no one knows a Rolex reference. The tough part no is when you, you get into you yeah, sub. Exactly. You have this. That's it. They need to refine their their collection. And if you get really into the nitty gritty of Rolex, of course, you have Bart Simpson, you have this, you have that. Which is vintage. Exactly, which is saying that's history and you have to be like, okay, well, I guess that's because of this. I guess it's because of that. Grand Seiko, though, a lot of the times people will be like, oh, you got the Omiwatari Peacock edition. like, Or or you got the Sky Flake and stuff like that. Where They're mixing a bunch of stuff and it's like... The barrier to entry is is very tough when you go yes. one rung above. You never, you know, when you're when you're. This is a super mass market, right? They're like sure. these are all over the world, and you, you know, I just don't think you want to be the dork swatch. Mm. So if you don't want to be the dork swatch, don't release a collection that could only be understood by dorks. When I say dorks, I mean people that are so into into it and into the nuance that it's actually off-putting to the rest of us who are like, yeah, I'll give you some time. I'd like to learn about your brand as opposed to, oh, I want to know everything. I had the, Chill. the famous story is, and this guy is great. I know him, we email, we talk a lot, but in, in the context of a Grand Seiko event, you're safe, but he pulled a loop out of his pocket and right. was like, Look at the difference between the top of the hand and the side of the hand. Right. And I was like, that we are both dorks, so yes. that's cool to see. But like, that doesn't translate to the guy at the pizza shop with a giant Rolex on that wants to know he has a Rolex right. on. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So you know, obviously they're different business models, blah blah blah. blah. But yeah, I, course, I do course, think that I do think that that you're definitely right that the limited editions are have gotten a little bit out of control, uh, and I think that. Um, and I mean, I think that, I think that Grand Seiko has fallen a little bit out of popularity in the last year. Interestingly, uh, for yeah. sure. I mean, for sure. And uh, I don't love them any less. I love Grand Seiko. I recommend Grand Seiko constantly, all the time, to everyone. Yes, all the time. Oh yeah. Um, but you know, again, I have years. I, I I know that people are. I think back. People have moved a little bit back to not giving them the credit they deserve. Yes. And that wasn't the case for a minute there. Yeah. For a minute there, people were continuing to give them the credit they deserve more and more and more. Yep. And then they fell off a little bit, not because of any material reason, not because the watches got, you know, worse, not because it changed anything. Yeah, right. You know, although the one thing that, that people that I, I just wonder, I'd love to speak to someone at Grand Seiko um, on the manufacturer, on the design end. Mm. So many people... Complain about the bracelets. Yeah, I knew the answer before and you even said it. And I don't feel one way or the other. I don't really like bracelets, so yeah, you know, I'm a sports watch guy, so I don't really care. Yeah. Um, but it's like if the entire world is telling you, "Hey, brand that is really trying to grow and come and and and, and win me over," I don't like your bracelets. Like your bra- and then, then they say, ah, la, 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 la. "It's yeah, like right, okay, right. F- off, dude." Yeah, right. Like America is definitely a bracelet culture. With watches. Oh, yeah. Definitely. Being a leather strap guy is definitely, in, you're in the minority. It's not far. easy for guys like you out it's there. It's not easy for guys like me. No, it's not. So so that is, that's almost bizarre that they have not readdressed Especially this. because they are hyper involved in the community. Bizarre. Since I entered the watch world and was looking at Seiko's, this is common knowledge. The pictures from a $20 Seiko to a $50,000 Grand Seiko on their websites are not good. Really? They're 3D renderings. Like, yeah. this is a, I see that as a watch. Yeah. I don't see it on anyone's wrist. I don't see a background. I don't see anything right. like that. Yeah. For all of these watches, all of the pictures that I pulled for our discussion, I pulled not on Grand Seiko's site. I, I don't know if you separate that. websites, yeah. Because it makes the watch, you're like, oh, wow, that is a gorgeous watch. Yes. But when it's reduced to... So it's very sterile. Exactly. It's very sterile. Which is very interesting because I don't know... The logic behind that, there certainly is some. If it's from Seiko to Grand Seiko, it's a brand choice. But I do think that tactile feel of this watch, when you look at it, isn't conveyed 
on Grand Seiko's site, right. and you immediately have to go somewhere else. Agreed. I think that's very interesting. Agreed. The last point that I want to bring up to you is we've talked about Grand Seiko before a lot. Like, what is going to be that crazy watch, that crazy Grand Seiko watch that people just go nuts over? Yeah. My theory was always sports watches. I was like, something with the Explorer, something with that. Mm. But I think Grand Seiko's polishing is so precise that it gets tough sometimes with their sports line models because you have Zeratsu polishing mixed in with like some things that aren't polished that way and it makes their sports models have a dressy flair. But when they lean fully into dress watch, I think they have an unbelievable style that is the refinement of this Japanese brand. And I would love it, and this is the most predictable thing I could ever say, if they had a chronograph that looked like this and not like a sports watch. It doesn't put you in this like hot horology or anything like that, but it puts you in a point of, wow, that is an alternative to anything else I was looking for. <laughs> you know what I think? I think, I think that you're, I think that you're hundred percent right. Um, but I'll even take it a step further. Do it. I think that Grand Seiko needs a in, you know, a, a, what's the word I'm looking Defibrillator? for? Defibrillator? Defibrillator. Yes. Right? Grand, Grand Seiko needs to wake the world up again, right? Uh, and with a statement. Yes. And I don't yes. think that a watch release alone will do it. I think that it needs to be... <laughs> I think a political stance. A political <laughs> stance. I think that they need to, you know, coordinate a, a public message with, with a watch, yep. with a new watch, sure. and with maybe an altered bracelet. Maybe, you know mm. what it could be? It could be like two new watches, a new bracelet. I think they need to have a, a, a well-coordinated public message. I would, I would, I really do feel from, from a leader at the organization, not just domestically, but internationally, I would say a Japanese leader at the company. Yep. Someone needs to come out in with artistry Right, like, yeah. like, like, remember the, the old Apple things, or they still do them. But like when Jobs did them, there, you know, there was artistry oh, because yeah. it, it right, was right. like an iconic thing, and he was special, and that was special. But I don't think that will cut it for a brand that is not led by someone as special as Steve. Jobs. He was so charismatic yeah, that it course. worked. You know, I think that this, this. This needs to be like really well produced, yep. really well produced, and in coordination with all the major, major publications, with all of them, mm. right? This would take a, a year of planning just on the just on the creative end, of or eight months of planning on the creative end, and then on the development end, or the strategy end. I think they need to pare down some of their watches and slow down in limited release. Mm -hmm. I think they need to introduce a new bracelet for all of these watches. Yes. Okay. Yep. That, that I, that honestly, I would even say with a program, uh, will give you a rebate <laughs> to the people that bought the ones you didn't like. Yep. And the corporate leader could stand behind and say, I happen to disagree with you. I like the old bracelet, right? but I am listening and, and I'm, I'm speaking your language and we worked on it and introducing the new and whatever you know thing yep okay and and i think that they need to stop it with all these fucking references they need to be much more focused and um and finally i think that you're right one watch that is truly a showstopper uh like the, maybe two watches a showstopper chronograph yeah okay because every chronograph by grand seiko now is is really quite unappealing it's quite tactical to the vast majority of people yes. like i know one guy with the grand seiko chronograph 17 millimeters like, thick. that's it. Right. It, it, it it is not my style right they are beautiful they are expensive they are well finished they are you know, oh, they're fantastic innovative watches right but this is not a watch for most people this is a watch for almost nobody yes. okay yes. uh so something like a chronograph like you just said a perfectly designed chronograph in a traditional kind of sense two pushes on the sbg w231 <laughs> Amazing. Oh, yeah. Okay. And I also think, well, I don't think you think, and you're 100% right, that they need like an Explorer Submariner alternative, uh, uh, just just one great Submariner alternative. And I think that that speaks more to the mass. Yes. I don't think the chronograph would be as commercially successful just because people oh, no. are interested in dress watches. Of course. But that will get the attention of all of the you know, watch publications. That's what watch people will freak out over. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then the world will freak out over this new Submarine alternative at $9,500. Yeah, so there's the Rolex model, and then there's this Japanese fine polishing seasonal, like, 
spiritual model. Right. I'm going to check that out. That's pretty cool. Right. Yeah. You know, and, and that's it. I mean, that's, that's, that's what I think. And, and I think that, you know, and it's kind of ironic that I'm saying this after a very long winded, you know, uh, <laughs> you say short, to say. but, but I really do think that, that y- you need to know who you're speaking to, right? Yeah. I am speaking in long sentences because I am speaking to people that spend their time during the day watching watch content. So they yes. are coming here for that. You're like, I'm, I'm speaking in very long sentences without break so I can prevent a certain idiot from talking. Yeah. <laughs> I'm over there like, I think a quonograph would be <laughs> quonograph. But when you are selling something to someone that is not a total fucking geek, and I use that as a compliment, yes. you gotta be shorter. You gotta be quicker. You have to be, your, your messaging has to be tight. And I don't think their messaging is tight. I agree. It is so long winded and it doesn't need to be. Yes. I'm done. I'm done too. That's it. Thank you guys so much for watching this episode. Yeah. Watch another one. Yeah. Why not? We'll talk in long winded sentences.